Almighty Father in heaven, in the name of your Son, our glorious and victorious Savior, Jesus Christ, we humbly ask for your blessing upon our worship of you on this, your holy and sanctified Sabbath day, so that we may grow more in our knowledge of you, our love for you, and our obedience to you. And God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons, and for days and years, and let them be for lights in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth, and it was so. And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day, and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. And God set them in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth, and to rule over the day and over the night, and to divide the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. Amen. History and Prophecy in the News for the week of December 27 to January 2. January 2, 1971, a team of Israeli scholars announced the discovery in Jerusalem of a 2,000-year-old skeleton of a crucified male. Found in a cave tomb, it was the first direct physical evidence of the sparsely documented Roman method of execution. And I sort of disagree with that. It is not sparsely documented. It was certainly widely used. Uh, many people think of the crucifixion just of Christ when they think of that, but of course in the Bible record itself, um, Christ was crucified with two other men, two thieves. The point of that, though, if you have to keep in mind, uh, was that he was innocent, and that he was sort of a glaring truth amidst the darkness of the fact that criminals were executed, and he himself, Christ, who was the God of the Old Testament, we'll link on for that study, the execution of criminals is biblical, if for murderers, and for other things as well, but he didn't do anything. And that was the glaring difference of it. That crucifixion was very much uh, a part of the Roman method of execution. They did not themselves uh, invent it. Uh, the Persians had a version of it, although the Persian version, Persian version was more a, an impaling rather than a crucifixion. But the stake was there in the same way. And the Roman, uh, we'll put the link on for the study, uh, describing just exactly what that cross was, because the upright post was there, and that staros, as it's described, which has a lot of people, when they read that, they see that, yes, it was just an upright post, so they therefore assume, well, he had to have been crucified with just his hands nailed uh, above his head and so on, on a straight up-and-up -up post. But the cross piece was brought to the place of execution, as is plainly described in the scriptures itself, um, but it was just exactly that, the cross piece which was lifted up uh, again to fulfill a prophecy as well that Christ was lifted up and set into sort of a notch uh, at the top of the post so it was sort of like the shape of a capital T and if you look at the uh, the film I think I mentioned this before the film um, The Passion of the Christ the two thieves in that film they had the genuine sorts of crosses that's what the crosses genuinely looked like but unfortunately they just had to give in to false tradition and they put Christ on the so-called Latin cross and it just wasn't the way it was. But if you've seen the, the film Passion of the Christ, as many millions of people have, those crosses that he used there for the two thieves, they look like a capital T, that is how the crosses looked. And that's exactly what Christ's cross looked like. And some people say, well, how did they get the sign in? But the person, he, the executed person hung down enough that they could still put the sign on top. December 30, 1993, Israel and the Vatican signed an agreement on mutual recognition, seeking to put behind them 2,000 years of often bitter relations. And that in itself is fulfilling a prophecy, because we know the end-time beast power uh, is going to be in Israel, invited in Israel. There's certainly not going to be an invader, because Israel, as we've mentioned many times before, has nuclear weapons, and they're not going to lose any more wars. Because if they were about to lose one, conventionally they would launch their nukes, everything. So the end-time beast power and the end-time abomination of desolation, which will include both a military president, aggressor president, dictator, emperor, if you will, whatever term you want to use, and his great false prophet, Roman Catholic Church Pope, uh, will both be there. And this is another you know, signing the Vatican on mutual recognition. So, And also by then, uh, perhaps, 
uh, the Vatican's long century old call to make Jerusalem an international city perhaps in the end time part of that will be fulfilled and that too would also work uh, for whatever uh, that holy place is going to be uh, personally I believe the Ark of the Covenant is going to be found and that will demand an, a holy place to be built for it that's the reason the original tabernacle in the wilderness was constructed that's the reason the temple was built was to house the Ark of the Covenant and if it's found which I believe it's going to be I think it's under the Temple Mount it's been there since the fall of Jerusalem to the Babylonians we'll put the link on for Raiders of the Lost Ark to explain and prove from the Bible that it has to be there it can't be anywhere else that once it's found something's going to have to be built and it doesn't have to be some great uh, very grand Herodian temple or something like that or something that Solomon originally built you know because the tabernacle in the wilderness was a tent it's animal skins and curtains and yet it was just as holy and just as sacred as any of the, the temples built by Solomon or Herod. So, you know, it's just a matter of what's in there, not a matter of the of the, the package, if you will. December 29, 1940, 1,500 fires started in one day alone by German bombers, dropping thousands of incendiary bombs on the center of London during the Blitz winter of 1940-41. to 41. The bombing caused the worst damage in the great, since the Great Fire of 1666. And, of course, the very destructiveness of that. But the Blitz as, as well, night after night after night, the bombings uh, had a very negative psychological effect, needless to say, and that's certainly it's an understatement, along with the physical damage done to London and, and so on, the people suffered psychologically very much. It was m as much a, a psychological war, the terrorist war, if you will, as it was just simply a matter of bombing buildings, physical structures, because you know they can be rebuilt. Terrorism uh, has that effect, doesn't it? Terrorism, you know, is not a, a modern-day thing. It's something that's been around for a long time. It's, it's a tactic of war. You know, by its nature, the name, the term terrorism, it's a psychological thing. If you can get people to change their behavior, then the terrorists have achieved their goal. I mean, look at what happened after 9-11, the response there, and how the United States has become a very, very different country. Very different. And there, there was another one, actually, just over, I think it was on Christmas, was it not? You know, this sort of thing where a man uh, on a flight from uh, uh, Amsterdam to Detroit tried to uh, set off a device uh, as the plane was making its final approach, apparently. He waited... Uh, rather than setting it off over the Atlantic or something. And by the way, that particular one, I don't know, was that a direct flight from Amsterdam to Detroit? Did it stop anywhere? I, I guess it didn't, because if it was a direct flight, it would have taken it right over our heads here. Uh, Detroit is only about 100 miles um, from here, 90 or 100 miles, and Amsterdam uh, is in the direct flight. So if he would have detonated the thing on final approach, it would have brought that airliner actually down in Ontario because Detroit's right on the border. And if it was just a, a straight-in final approach without circling the airport, if, the, if they didn't have to wait to land, uh, it would have brought it down over Ontario, somewhere between here and Detroit. So, And look at the responses to that now, the terrorist response. He didn't bring the plane down. Apparently his bomb uh, didn't work out, the detonator or whatever didn't work. He burned himself. But did he accomplish a goal anyway? Look at the heightened, and particularly just during the travel season, a lot of people during their Christmas to New Year's Eve, New Year's break, or winter holidays down to Florida or Arizona or someplace. Look at what's happened there now. The lineups here at the Toronto airport, I see that they said they're telling people to show up three hours early for a flight, you know, from Toronto to Miami or something. I mean, you know, that's you practically you're waiting longer than it takes to fly. And you have to now the the passports, and you have to have uh, apparently they're bringing in new uh, an online thing where you have to apply at least three days ahead, and they check all that out. And when you go to the airport, you are fingerprinted and photographed and patted down. It's like you're a criminal, you know. Grandma and the kids going to Disneyland, and everybody's treated like a criminal. So what have the terrorists accomplished? You know, think about it. The war on terrorism, because every time there's a response, the terrorists win. And that's, that's what's so hard to defeat about it. You know, they can't defeat a country, but they can cause a country to change. And they've certainly, I think, accomplished that. And the effect that's had in, in all other countries. So terrorist is not, not new, but it's something uh, in this day and age, perhaps because of modern communications or the technology as well, how vulnerable we are, things that happen. Uh, the Internet, you know, is a very powerful thing, but, you know, everything is so dependent on the Internet. I shouldn't even say it, should I? 
because they the terrorists have more or less left that alone. But imagine, you know, without getting going on that, I don't want to give anybody any ideas, but everything is dependent upon the Internet now. Everything. And, you know, consider where that's going. They've been picking on airliners for some reason. Personally, if I were a terrorist, I wouldn't bother with airliners. I think there's a much uh, something much more destructive that could be dealt with. So I'd, I'd best perhaps shut up, really, but without giving anybody any ideas. But airliners, you know, Luckily, this last one, though, was he apparently was a rather incompetent terrorist. And that's good, isn't it? Where his bomb didn't go off. Uh, apparently, it was a high explosive, but the detonator didn't go off. And when he was trying to do it, a lot of the passengers, and even flying on a plane now, you, you know, everybody's just sort of paranoid. And perhaps uh, the, the one passenger that, that jumped him, uh, perhaps that helped. Perhaps it did prevent it from going down, from getting, you know, the detonator to go off right correct, so without getting going on all of that, but it's a different world, isn't it? And anymore, it's just, it seems to be the attitude is is very different. But it's not new. That's my point. Uh, that terrorism has been around a long time. And it's unfortunate that perhaps back in the good old days, the crude good old days, terrorists couldn't do as much. You know, they could attack people or assassinate people, which was bad enough. But nowadays, the modern technology as we said, or modern communications where everybody just knows about it. Maybe that's it. That we're so on top of what's going on in the world instantly that a single act can just spread around the world. Maybe that's it. The technology permits people to know about it. And of course, there was an attack on the Pope as well. Um, on, uh, I guess it was midnight mass, uh, or else uh, 10 p.m. Mass, they moved it back. First time in the history of the papacy, they moved the pa uh, midnight Mass to 10 p.m. because the Pope is getting uh, apparently somewhat frail. Um, he's a very different man. They used to call him the tank cardinal because he had a very aggressive personality. And a lot of people were rather uh, deeply concerned when Cardinal Ratzinger became Pope because they thought, well, if he's going to behave as Pope as he did as a cardinal, uh, the world had better look out, but he's become very different. Perhaps it's his age. Uh, he's now 82, uh, which doesn't necessarily mean anything. There's a lot of very tough 82-year-olds around, too, but um, apparently he's not one of them, and he was uh, just changed. He's become very meek, and uh, the video of that young woman, who apparently that was her second attempt. She did it, tried to do it last year as well, but she, she hopped over that railing. Uh, she really flew over that railing at that She's rather uh, physically fit anyway, the way she hopped over it. And grabbed. she apparently grabbed the Pope in front of his vestments, and when the bodyguards grabbed her, everybody went down. She dragged the Pope down as well. Apparently he was not hurt, but another one was. Uh, tragically, uh, there was a, I believe he was French, a French Pope, or a French Cardinal, who was standing beside the Pope. He's late in, in his late 80s, and he apparently broke his leg, and that's, that's very tragic because someone breaks... A bone at that age, it's it's going to be a difficult recovery, a long recovery. So the tragedy there of that, and certainly um, we have no animosity toward uh, people, even the Pope. Now, many people mistake that when we speak of the papacy, but it's the office, the deception. And I think personally, most popes don't even realize that they're that they're the great deceivers. That's the blind leading the blind. You know, most of them. You know, come uh, the later resurrection, a lot of popes are going to be resurrected, and they might someday become good Christians. Some of them. All we know for sure is the last one's going to burn. And that's good indication that he's going to know the truth. Whereas uh, the other, a lot of the other ones up to this point, I don't think they did. I really don't. You know, because if you look at Martin Luther, for example, uh, he was a good Catholic. What is regarded as a good Catholic. He saw the morality, the corrupt morality of the papacy at that time, and that's what he rebelled against. That's what he protested. But he kept all the other doctrine. And, you know, Luther himself was a good example of how someone can literally put their life on the line, which he did, for no better reason than maintaining, doctrinally maintaining the status quo, because that's what he did. Really, he just, he defied the leadership. He rebelled against the leadership, not against the doctrines. Because after the Protestant Reformation, just as is evident in Protestantism today, you know they still have the Sunday and the Easter and the Trinity and the immortal soul and the ever-burning hell and on and on and on. 
There is no difference in the doctrines. So, and we can't sit in judgment of them for that reason. We can only judge them in the sense of not going along with their errors. That we have a right to judge between right and wrong, but we don't have a right to judge them in terms of their salvation or or them as humans on a personal level. But we we must make a distinction for our own selves between whether what they believe and teach is, is of the Word of God truly or whether it's not. And in their case, it's not. I mean, it's plain it's not. So it's complicated, but if you sort of back it up a little bit and just look at things as a simple matter, right and wrong in this world, and remembering that God is in heaven and he's the judge and he's going to bring his justice and his truth and everything else upon everybody, including the misguided people who think that blowing up airliners is a good thing, you know, they think they're going to go instantly to paradise and all that. Well, no, they're not. They're going to go instantly to somewhere because the death people who are di dead don't realize they are dead. It will seem instantaneous, but it's not the paradise that's going to be waiting for them. He's going to find find out. All the people are going to find out who committed those acts that they were deceived by people who were probably, probably themselves just as deceived. And on and on and on and on it goes. And really it's never going to stop until Christ comes. Puts a stop to it. And until then, the the greatest irony of all that until then as it has always been that the greatest danger to true Christians are the people who think they're Christian you know it's not the a matter of uh, the Muslims or you know the Muslims are considered the big terrorist threat but mostly what they're doing is a matter of politics not of, not of religion you know they're committing their terrorist acts because they want all the Westerners out of their countries it's really what it comes down to and the Western nations well they can't do that because of the oil and other vested interests you know if the, if the oil wasn't there you probably wouldn't see much difference there are other parts of the world where there are dictators and all sorts of problems but it isn't bothered with because you know there's no oil there's no vested interest whereas the Middle East such as it is um, is going to be what it's going to be until the oil runs out and then they'll start fighting over something else actually the future is talking about the the next oil wars are actually going to be over water, fresh water. So, but as far as Christianity is concerned, that's the greatest irony. You know, people who think they need to push you into becoming Christian, they're kind of Christian, because they think, well, you're just halfway between Jewish and Christian, you need to get rid of that Old Testament, despite the fact that the God of the old, so-called God of the Old Testament was Christ, it always has been, we'll put the link on for that, the reason they, the people of Judah wanted to kill Christ, they wanted to stone him for blasphemy, is because he simply told them the truth about who he was. You know, before Abraham was, I am. You know, it was Christ that spoke to Moses, face to face. Put on the, the link for the trysting tent. He spoke to, to, to Abraham. It was Christ that renamed Jacob as Israel. And on and on, all the people there. It was Christ who was the creator. We'll put the link on for that. But they want to reject that and call them, they call themselves New Testament Christians while ignoring the fact that Christ has been there literally from day one. He was the one that gave the Ten Commandments, including his Sabbath that Christ invented. You know, when he rested on the Lord God, rested on the seventh day, that was Christ. He was sent by the Father to do all the work of creation in preparation for a place where God is coming someday when Christ's work has been completed with the link on for the throne of God from heaven to earth. So it's a matter of well, a lack of understanding by those who perhaps are wanting to understand. Their hearts are in the good place, as we said. When we condemn the teachings, the erroneous teachings of a particular church organization, that doesn't mean we're condemning the people, because most of us came from those very organizations. I was once a Catholic. Most of my, my relatives, my family, are still Catholic. And needless to say, they don't quite agree with uh, what we teach here. They think it's rather strange. You know, to believe in the Bible, what do you want the Bible for, they think. But we know the reason to that. The answer to that, though, don't we? It's because it was given to us by Christ. And that's what being a Christian is all about. Once the Holy Spirit comes, and in due time it's going to, all the world, all the mess is going to get sorted out. And that's good, isn't it? Thy kingdom come. And we surely look forward to it. We have entered a new year on the Roman calendar.
The date of this sermon is January the 2nd, 2010, or 2010. But is it really? That's the question. Um, and a lot of people could write and say, no, it's not. Uh, all the different um, controversies with the calendar. Um, so I thought today we would just have a look at the origin of this calendar that uh, we use, even though it is Roman, and even though it is a part of Roman, the Roman system, political, religious, actually the calendar such as it is, the Gregorian calendar is named after a pope, so you can see the connection there, and it's pretty hard to escape it. If someone were to ask you, for example, what is your birthday, what would you tell them? You don't have to say it, but you realize it's a Roman calendar date. Most people do not know their birth date on the biblical calendar. And you know, even if you did, it would not be uh, the same day of the year, for example, on the Roman calendar, because the biblical calendar, which is based on the movements of the sun and moon, uh, operates on a 19-year 19 19 -year time cycle. So it can be sort of confusing. But it's something, you know, we've lived with, we as Christians have lived with for a long time. A lot of people get excited about it, and certainly it's it's something to be excited about, but, you know, we compared it to being uh, in a fish tank. You're like a fish in the tank, and the water is just sort of mucky and dirty, and but naturally the, the mucky stuff is down near the bottom. So we try to swim up to the top as much as we can sort of get into the clearest water which also by the way is closer to the light we can the light gets a little brighter so you see the analogy there but either way we're still in the tank we still have to live with it and you know our birth dates or the calendar that we're using now uh, it's just hard to get away from and people of the true church of God have never gotten away from it they lived with it Jesus Christ lived with it you know what was Jesus political citizenship if he had a passport what would his citizenship say on that passport? You realize, of course, it would be Roman. He was a Roman citizen. He was born in Roman-occupied Judea, just as the Apostle Paul claimed Roman civil rights when he was arrested. He claimed his Roman civil rights as a citizen because he was a Roman citizen, even though he was born up in Tarsus, but it was all Roman-occupied territory. You know, people in Britain at that time could claim Roman citizenship because at that time at the time there were Roman legions in Judea at the time that Jesus Christ walked the streets of Jerusalem there were also Roman troops in London and throughout southern England we'll put the link on for that study of the map of the Roman Empire which shows the spread it went all the way across the Middle East and southern Europe and up into Britain you know there was the question of could the apostles have could for example Paul have traveled to Britain, as some people think he did. We know he went as far as Spain, or he was going to, and that's certainly on the route, sea route around the European coast, you know, and the Roman roads and so on. He made use of those for his ministry. But without getting into that today, the fact is it was the Roman world then, just as like it's a Roman world now, and we have to live with this as it is. Even though, for example, we observe the Lord's holy days using the Lord's calendar. You know, we don't observe the Lord's Holy Days using the Roman calendar, even though we'll put, for example, the equivalent dates on. Even these sermons, you know, you can we have the Hebrew calendar date, or the Lord's calendar date on the sermon, but we also have the Roman calendar equivalent. And you'll notice there's always the two dates on the Roman calendar equivalent, because days begin uh, in the Lord's eyes from sunset. They run from sunset to sunset, and that requires us to put on the two Roman dates. Not that it runs more longer on the Roman calendar, it's still 24 hours, but it runs from sunset Friday to sunset Saturday on the Roman calendar. But on the Hebrew calendar, or the Lord's calendar, it's only one day. It's the same day. One date. So you can see it can be confusing, but if you understand it, it's not that confusing. And it's just something we have to live with. But I thought today we would just have some a little factual reality check of this Roman calendar that's so much a part of the world that we are forced to live in for the time being. And, you know, a lot of people have debated as well. We won't get into the Hebrew calendar. There are those who believe that somehow uh, it's better and that if we can just shift it, just start using it, in, it exclusively, that somehow all the it'll all just be so much clearer and so much easier. But, you know, the biblical calendar has been 
interpreted, if you will, by Jewish scholars or the Hebrew scholars, and they have controversies as well. So you sort of have to pick your choice there and see what you come up with because you're going to find then a discrepancy or a difference. And one of them is going to have to be wrong. The problem isn't with the calendar as it was originally created, as we read in our uh, opening prayer, but rather that people have interpreted it in different ways, imperfect people. So they don't have the full answers either. So if you're looking for absolute perfection in this life, you're never going to find it except perhaps in your own mind, and that's just an illusion. You know, we are being perfected as Christians. Not meaning we are perfect, but we're being perfected by learning and growing toward that perfection that will come when we're no longer physical. But until then, you know, it's just not there. So, let's have a look today at this Roman calendar that we have to live with. Some surprising things. I'll just do a few fair use quotes from the Encyclopedia Britannica just to stick to the facts that we're trying to do. And by the way, what we're trying to do as well uh, we're updating a lot of the graphics on Daily Bible Study. Uh, I want to uh, start using more extensive use of maps and charts and graphics that are directly uh, related to the topic that is in the study rather than uh, something that just simply provides a little bit of visual relief from the text, as some, many of the illustrations are. So we'll try to do that a little more and that's being updated. You may notice um, that a lot of the graphics on the on the website are all white, blank images, and that's the reason we're updating those. We had to, to do a, a complete set of them. We just wanted to make an inventory of them and then uh, download them and see what we've got, uh, where things are being are going to be changed. So, And they will be changed in a good way because they'll be much more direct. Uh, to the topic at hand rather than just sort of a generic illustration. And a lot of things, uh, graven images as well, people write about those once in a while. Um, we're going to try to focus more on maps and uh, charts, to factual things. But just consider, this is uh, just a very general statement for the article for calendar. Quote, this is from the Encyclopedia Britannica, quote, the basic unit of computation in a calendar is the day, and although days are now measured from midnight, this has not always been so. Astronomers, for instance, from about the 2nd century AD until 1925, counted days from noon to noon. In earlier civilizations and among primitive peoples, where there was less communication between different settlements or groups, different methods of reckoning, the day presented no difficulties. Most primitive tribes used a dawn-to-dawn -dawn reckoning, calling a succession of days so many dawns, or suns, and this system was continued by the Babylonians and Greeks, who counted a day from sunrise to sunrise. In Egypt, a midnight-to-midnight -midnight reckoning was adopted. The Jews, and later the Italians, counted from sunset to sunset. The Teutons counted nights, and from them the grouping of 14 days called a fortnight. Derived in a quote. So you can see there from that, it's been counted practically every possible way. But isn't it interesting, though, where it says the Jews and later the Italians counted from sunset to sunset? And that's correct. The, 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 Itali the Latin calendar, the Roman calendar, was in fact based upon the correct calendar. They had it kind of right. It certainly as much right. And they also began their, their year in the spring, not in January. That's the reason, you know, the months, uh, September, sept is a, is a prefix which means seven, but today September is the ninth month. And October means eight, and today it's the tenth. And December means ten, and today it's the twelfth. So they did have it, right, and they didn't have the midnight beginning and everything, so they had it sort of correct, but they just sort of got it all mixed up. They accommodated the paganism that was there. And also the, the question often comes in, uh, why do you call it... Uh, for example, B.C. And, and A.D. Many people believe that A.D. means after death, as in Christ after Christ's death. But it means Anno Domini in, from in Latin, which means year of our Lord, um, and which means beginning from his birth. And, of course, there is also the matter of they now realize that Christ was not born in 1 A.D. or And, of course, there was no 0 A.D., no year 0. 
but he was likely born somewhere around, and this is based upon the death of Herod, he was likely born around 4 or 5 B.C. Some think as early as 7 B.C., but personally I think it was around 4 or 5, which would make the calendar now, if you're going Anno Domini with the year 1 being the, the birth year of Christ, uh, we would now be in 2014 or 2015 without trying to add to the confusion of it, because I know some people are going to jump on that one and sort of go with it, but it's beside the point. You know, it's, it's where we are and irrelevant anyway to what is there. And even, as I said, even the Jewish, uh, you can ask, uh, there is a difference in the in the Hebrew scholars' reckoning of what year it is as well. So you're not going to find, perhaps the, the biggest point of this sermon, or the most important point in understanding this sermon, is there is no perfection. You sort of have to understand things in a wide, wide open, eye open way, and then you're going to be quite a, you're going to be quite happy, and you're going to be able to function. Whereas if you just become stuck on a particular controversy, you're just going to spin your wheels forever. You're never going to get a final answer, other than in your own mind. You'll just have to become absolutely dogmatic in your own mind, and just sort of shut everything else out. You become rigid, but you're not going to be right. That's the point. Whereas if you understand the whole, the holistic reality of the of the fish tank that we're living in, you're going to be able to function and get on with it. So, like personally, I, I don't like using the Roman calendar, but what else can we do? It's what we've been given to use. And, you know, as we said, at the time of Christ, the Apostle Paul and Peter and all the rest of them, they had to use it as well. The, the, whatever version was being used then. While at the same time, they recognized... The biblical calendar dates for observing Passover and everything. It didn't interfere with what they did in their Christian lives. But at the same time, they had to live in the civil world that was being run by civil governors and kings and things that had nothing to do with religion. And quite often, even though they became sort of religious, it didn't really have anything to do with the truth. And it didn't affect the truth. And any time usually it did is when people began being persecuted true Christians are being persecuted because of it. And the people of Judah as well. You know, they were as well, even though those who rejected Christ. So it's just all all these different things. Just like we read here, all the different day starts of the day. I mean, they had practically every possible time. But that doesn't affect us now, does it? You know, we're living our Christian lives. It doesn't matter what they did. And it doesn't matter if the Roman calendar says it's 2010. What difference does it make? We're not, it doesn't interfere with us. We have to deal with it in a civil, a civil citizens of whichever country we live in, but that doesn't affect anything. I mean, if we have a, a birth certificate, it's got a Roman calendar date on it. If you've got a driver's license, it's got a Roman calendar date on it. You've got a, a passport, it's got a Roman calendar date on it. And what are you going to do? Go erase all of that? You know, probably would make the document invalid. And the way the security is at airports anymore, you sure don't want to mess around with your passport because anything you know anything out of the ordinary appearance appearance on it you're probably going to get taken somewhere and questioned you know you can't even joke at the airport anymore people with a sense of humor um, best leave it at home when you go to the airport anymore jokes can get you in a lot of trouble you sound or have to be stone faced and you know don't say anything other than yes sir no sir and here I go sir and that's tragic, but it's the reality, isn't it? It's just the way it is. Let's have a few interesting looks, some facts of the calendar. Just We'll put on some links as well of studies we've done about the, for example, the naming of the days of the week. And most people do realize that Sunday is based upon the sun, and Monday is the moon day, and Woden's day, uh, Thor's day, those are pagan gods, and Freya's day, uh, all pagan gods, it's their pagan day, and so on. Uh, whereas the Bible, actually, the only day of the week that has a name, a specified name, is the Sabbath. or and As well, the preparation day, the sixth day. But the rest are numbered. The first day, second day, third day. Uh, the sixth day is preparation day, and the Sabbath is, of course, the seventh day. But you see, we can know that and still live in a, in a Sunday to, to Saturday world. Although there are calendars as well, there's an increasing tendency um, where uh, the days of the week are shown beginning on Monday and run to Sunday. I had a little uh, something I used on my computer 
it was a, a calendar for uh, sort of sort of um, keeping track, planning a week. And I, I downloaded it and I opened it and I found out it had Monday as the first day of the week, so I can't use it. I chose not to use. It. I can use it physically; it doesn't prevent me. But I just it's it's an affront. It puts Sunday as the seventh day of the week, so I couldn't use it. I deleted it. So you know, and yet we're still living within that world as it is. So we have to do that. It's just the way it is. But it doesn't affect us. We're still free to make those choices. So, a few facts today from the Encyclopedia Britannica. We'll just do this one. This is interesting because really the connection to this ancient time and what we're living with today is, is direct. This is a, a subheading, the early Roman calendars. It's from the Encyclopedia Britannica. Very interesting. A lot of facts here. Quote, this originated as a local calendar in the city of Rome, supposedly drawn up by Romulus some seven or eight centuries B.C. The year began in March and consisted of ten months, six of thirty days, and four of thirty-one days, making a total of three hundred and four days. It ended in December to be followed by what seems to have been an unaccounted winter gap. Numa Pompilius, traditionally the second king of Rome, is supposed to have added two extra months, January and February, to fill the gap and to have increased the n total number of days by 50, making 354. To obtain sufficient days for his new months, he is then said to have deducted one day from the 30-day months, thus having 56 days to divide between January and February. But since the Romans had, or had developed, a superstitious dread of even numbers, January was given an extra day. February was still left with an even number of days, but as that month was given over to the infernal gods, this was considered appropriate. The system allowed for the year of 12 months and to have 355 days with an uneven number. Now, just to stop there, all of that was based on simply arbitrary nonsense. It wasn't based at all on nature, as the calendar truly was, and they did have it correct to some point, but this is getting now where they start dictating days. And again, you can look at it's the reason the Roman months can begin at any time of the lunar month, whereas the Lord's months begin at new moon or the sighting of the crescent or as close as possible to that time. It's, it's based on astronomy. Not astrology, but astronomy. Whereas this is, they're just getting into silliness here. I mean, this is plain silly this sort of calendar where they have 10 months and then suddenly for the next two months or for the next whatever, there's nothing. There was just a total gap until they added two more months and they ran out of months. Now that's pretty stubborn, isn't it? How they can just sort of deny that time exists for two months because they've arbitrarily decided that there's only 10 months. But they did it. Isn't that silly? Continue. The so-called Roman Republican calendar was supposedly introduced by the Etruscan Tarquinius Priscius, traditionally the fifth king of Rome, he wanted the year to begin in January, since it contained the festival of the god of gates, later the god of all beginnings, but expulsion of the Etruscan dynasty in 510 BC led to this particular reform being dropped. The Roman Republican calendar still contained only 355 days, with February having 28 days, March, May, Quintilius or July and October, 31 days each, January, April, June, Sextilius or August, September, November, and December, 29 days. And just to include, uh, interject there, Quintilius was named July after Julius Caesar, and Sextilius was later named August after Augustus, two Roman emperors. Continuing, and, but keeping in mind this was in the Republican era before uh, the emperors or the began. Continuing, it was basically a lunar calendar and short by ten and one quarter days of a 365 and a quarter day tropical year. So in order to prevent it from becoming too far out of step with the seasons, an intercalans or mercondius from mercies, meaning wages, since workmen were paid at this time of year, was inserted between February 23 and 24. It consisted of 27 or 28 days and was added once every two years in historical times at least the remaining five days of February were omitted the intercalculation was therefore equivalent to an addition of 
expedition 22 or 23 days, so that in a four-year period, the total days in the calendar amounted to 4 times 355 plus 22 plus 23, or 1,465 days, thus giving an average of 366.25 days per year. Intercalculation was the duty of Pontipices, a board that assigned the chief magistrate of his sacrificial function. Now, I'll just stop there and notice that word. Isn't it interesting? Pontipices, which is a Roman bureaucrat. Pontipices. Do you, do you, does that sound familiar? As in pontiff? Do you see how the, and by their church, was created in the image of that beast? Politically. Many of the things um, that... And again, the, the reason the Pope so easily grasped the calendar. Continuing. The reason for their decisions were kept secret, and, but because of some negligence and a measure of ignorance and corruption, the intercalculations were irregular and seasonal chaos resulted. In spite of this, the fact that it was over a day too long compared with the tropical year, much of the modified Roman Republican calendar was carried over into the Gregorian calendar, now in general use. And that's the reason I read the, all that. They admitted it's... Well, I'm just surprised it took them that long for it to fall into chaos. Because it was based on chaos. Literally from their day one there. But you notice there, much of it continued into what is today the Gregorian calendar. And that's the calendar we use this very minute, this very day. The Gregorian calendar, named after Pope. So you can see how the, the nonsense just sort of continued for centuries. And here we are. But again, the question, does that affect your Christianity? Does that somehow impede your progress as a Christian, your growth and your understanding of the truth? No, of course not. We can look at it and see the facts as they are. And it's, it's not, not a problem. And isn't it interesting how it continued right to this very day? Even though they knew it was chaotic. Why couldn't they just accept a month beginning with the new moon? You know, that's so simple even though the biblical calendar uh, has controversy because of people you know, they all argue when the, when the new moon, new crescent was sighted because you know even that the crescent sighted in Jerusalem for example this new, how the new moon was, was sighted witnesses in Jerusalem would sight the new crescent at the beginning of the new moon they would then set after the official acceptance by the high priest and so on who would then declare it a new moon a new month a, a signal fire would be lit and there would be people waiting within sight, but miles away on another hilltop. They would then light their signal fire, and throughout that night, the entire land of Israel would know it's a new month. But what if somebody, say, far up in Galilee, sighted the crescent before the people in Jerusalem did? Perhaps it was for whatever reason. And maybe there was some clouds. Because right at the very earliest crescent, it's a very, very tight time frame in order to see it. I, I did it for eight or nine years. It's hard to see anyway because it's close into the horizon. When you're looking outward, you're looking through far more more atmosphere, meaning why things are murkier on the horizon. You're seeing, you're looking through a much longer blanket of atmosphere than you are when you look straight up. So it's more difficult anyway, but say there was cloudy, just clouds in Jerusalem where they didn't see it, whereas someone up in Galilee did. Do you see? And what that could lead to? But it wouldn't matter because the official the official declaration and acceptance was in Jerusalem. So even then there can be some variation. But the Lord allowed for that. You know, it's not a problem. But it's a reality. That's the difference. It's the reality as it is. But you can you can see from even despite that, the Lord's calendar is perfect. It's based simply upon clean, clear observations of God's creation. Whereas what we read here about the Roman calendar and all the other calendars, this, this article um, in the Encyclopedia Britannica goes on and on about all the different kinds of calendars. Some were closer to nature than others, but most of them eventually failed because they allowed human interference in observing nature. Whereas the Lord's calendar, as we read in our opening prayer, is based upon Days, sunset to sunset, or months, new moon to new moon, or years, you know, the spring equinox to spring equinox. It was that simple. And humans, it's only when humans, it's like when the people of Judah returned 
from the Babylonian exile. They had God's law. They disobeyed it, grossly disobeyed it, which is the reason they were sent into exile. But when they returned after 70 years, they decided, well, we're never going to do that again. We're going to obey God's law. We're never going to be punished and sent off into exile like that again. So, and that's good. They had that part perfect. That's very good. But instead of obeying the pure law that they had, they started adding things. They just no take, no chances. They just decided we're going to add all these other things and the finer points. But eventually, look what happened there. It's their, their fine points, their own traditions, became a replacement for the law, so much so that by the time the Son of God came as the Messiah, they accused him of being a sinner because he observed God's true law rather than their traditions. And that included, no doubt, the calendar. So it's just a matter of looking things, looking through all the muck and just seeing the truth that's there. Because the muck is always going to be there. You just sort of have to ignore it, like a, a gold miner panning for gold. He ignores all the gravel, worthless little pebbles, and looks for the true gold that's in there. Don't let it pollute that purity as much as human purity can exist. Don't make the mistake that the people of Judah did when they returned from their Babylonian captivity, as we mentioned. They wanted to be so perfect that they ignored God's true law, and they created all sorts of their own little details. And what happened? Did that did that cure it? No. They, they crucified the Son of God when he came. And they were again destroyed as a kingdom, as a nation. They were occupied even at that time, and eventually everything was destroyed again, that next time by the Romans. So it didn't solve their problem, did it? You know, all they had to do is obey the law that they were given as best that they could. And you know, the law, the way it's given to us, is because of man's imperfections. If it were so perfect that we could obey it, we wouldn't even need a Savior. But the fact is, we can't even obey as much as we have. We can only do the best that we can. Because, you know, the devil really is in the details. Given what we are given, we can please God and obey God. But when you start creating details that in fact replace God's law, as what happened to those people who rejected Christ in his time, before their time came, because among them was a Pharisee named Saul, they were blinded, but they were blinded by themselves. But people today are the same thing. There's no difference. A lot of people scornfully look back at those people, the religious authorities, and just general people, general public, who rejected Christ, they're no different. They were no different than they are today. Same thing. You know, people will argue about the, the calendar, or they'll argue about some other detail. But why? Is it is sort of a contest of who's going to be the leader? Who's going to have all the answers that everybody has to obey? Well, we've already got that. That's pushing Christ out of the way, because he is our leader, and he does have the answers that we have to obey. But you notice he didn't have the nitpicky details that cause division and oppression to those who want to follow a misleader, an oppressor. Is it a matter of obeying God exactly as he said? You know, there are people who will write. This one comes up occasionally regarding just observing the Sabbath. They say, well, what about the international date line? You know, for some people it's the Sabbath. For other people it's, it's a completely different day. So how can there be a Sabbath, they say? And of course, the date line is an arbitrary creation of man as well, isn't it? It didn't exist. We are to observe the sun from sunset to sunset. That's the Sabbath. Seventh day of the week, wherever you are, you should observe your Sabbath. And it's that simple. But it doesn't say, add a massive amount of details that in fact, hide the Sabbath or turn the Sabbath into a burden or reject the Sabbath in favor of the, of the Roman Sunday. So you see the difference. And you'll notice, too, that we don't have a lot of scripture quotes in this particular sermon because man's calendars can't be scripturally proven. They have no scriptural basis. They have, are not based upon the Word of God. As we read, some days that begin any time of the day or night or years that begin any time of the year... And who is the author of confusion, I ask you? And you know the answer to that. Satan. He loves to bamboozle humans by making them think that they're right when in fact they're ignoring the very word of God. It's so pure and so simple. Not the meaning that we can 
obey it perfectly, but it gives us a whole lot clearer chance of doing the best that we can by observing it in the way that He's given it to us, rather than creating our own laws, claiming to be more righteous than God's law itself. And look at the result of that. And again, you know, a lot of people scornfully look back to the people of Judah who rejected Christ, but they're just the same today. In most cases, Christ would walk into a Christian professing church and preach a sermon exactly as he preached, as recorded in the Word of God, and most people would either get up and walk out on him, or more likely would rise up and throw him out. Probably beat him to death out in the church parking lot. And I'm not being sarcastic. I believe it would happen. Because he would tell those people what a complete mis-Christian group that they are. Or unchristian. And that gets people mad, doesn't it? But that's exactly what he told his own people. And they were going to stone him. So there's no difference. And human nature has not changed. It's the very same. All the calendars that you see are based upon man's arrogance, man's know-it-allness, ignoring the creation that's all around them. Instead of using it in the way that God gave to them, they turn it into a, a pagan god. An absolute insult to the Creator. They deny the true Creator while worshipping His creation as an idol, as pagan gods. You know, people will even do it with the Bible. There are people who worship the King James Bible, who idolize the King James Bible, if you want to go that far, they misuse it. They claim their righteousness is because of the Bible that they choose, but then again, they, at the same time, they don't even observe what's in it. Most people haven't even read it. Or they go to church on their Sunday and claiming that the King James Bible is the somehow most holy Bible that's ever been written, but it's full of mistakes and errors, just as is every other one. But that's not a threat to our salvation, is it? You know, the fix is in for us. By the means of the Holy Spirit, it gives us the means, the heart, to understand what we need to. And it applies to the calendar, but it can apply to everything else. I see people who just get trapped on these devil-in-the-details subjects, doctrines, anything. They'll make their entire Christian life based upon a single talk and they'll become great experts at it and they'll ignore everything else. And that's not the way it's meant to be. It just isn't. We need to observe God's pure truth and just leave out everything else. One of the surest tests in whatever it is that you believe, perhaps the prime test, and it takes a lot of honesty in order to make it work. But just ask yourself, if I didn't exist, and I'm meaning yourself, if you didn't exist, would you still want to believe what you do about a particular subject? I know that's hard because you can't believe it if you didn't exist, but I mean, would it be just as true if you weren't there wanting to believe it in a certain way? Does it suit your nationality? Does it suit where you are? Does it suit how you want to live your life? Because most Christian doctrines, including the calendar, you know, the Roman emperors, they came, they created their own version of Christianity, claimed to be Christian. Now the very church that that Roman Empire created claims to be the head of Christianity in place of Christ, the vicar of Christ. But you know, the first vicar of Christ wasn't the local bishop. It was the emperor. He claimed to be divine. And then he claimed to be Christ's divine representative on earth. And now the popes do the same thing. It's just a mixed up mess when people get swamped in details. They're like weeds in a garden. Now you plant your crop, and there it is, just as pure as can be. But almost immediately the weeds start. And the weeds will choke out your garden, just as the devil's details will choke out the truth. Same thing. Calendars, it's not just a matter. We could actually name the sermon practically anything besides the calendar. We did it today because it's the beginning of the Roman year that we're sort of stuck in as well. But we're not threatened by it. It's no problem. We live in it. We can't escape it. But you know, Christ lived in it, as we said. He lived in the Roman world. Roman calendar, the Roman paganism, 
Roman citizenship. He had it all too, same thing. But he wasn't overcome by it. Neither were all of his followers. Then, wherever since, doesn't matter. So, as we said, if you believe something, just ask yourself, would it still be a valid truth if you didn't exist? Begin with that one and answer it honestly and just see what you come up with. Because for a lot of things, including the calendar, it's going to be a very revealing thing, the psychology. You know, if you want to be a, a psychologist, I've come to realize the difference that psychologists study psychology in theory, whereas historians study psychology in fact, because really both are psychologists. If you can look at history and read history just based upon why people do what they do, their own self-interest, their own angle, and that's psychology. History is psychology, and that's the reason history repeats itself, because humans, the way their brains are set up to receive Satan's signals, as one man put it, we are subject to his influence, how he can bog us down with the details, the weeds in that garden. Gardening is a very biblical view. You know, the parable of the sower. Christ himself used that example. How weeds can come and choke things out. Or how things can be scorched in the sun. Because, you know, the sun can give light, but it can also scorch things. If you don't have the depth, that is the repentance to really accept what it says. Because, you know, light can keep you warm or it can burn you. You have to keep your eye on God's truth. And that's the same with the calendar. There are those who choose to observe the Lord's Sabbath plainly, cleanly, purely, as it's described to us. And there are those who choose to argue about it. And the calendar as well. If you read the Bible purely, by its very nature, purity means pure, without a lot of extraneous things added. Think about it. Look at all the holy days, how purely they were described, how little they were described. Even the Sabbath itself, a very plain statement. Look at the commandment for the Sabbath. Or look at our, our opening prayer, how simple that was, on what days and months and years were to be based upon. Very easy. And if you look at that way of obeying God, with the humility that that way requires in order to be able to do it, it works. It really does. We live in a world that you can be so easily bogged down in arguments, and divisions, and the calendar is one of the prime ones, actually. Certainly among the top two or three. But who wins if you take the bait and argue about the calendar rather than just getting on with it? And those who argue about the calendar, if you're one of them, have you ever actually read the entire Bible? All of it? Not only the nuts and bolts things in how things were to be done, but the attitude in how they were to be done, the difference between what was good and what was not. You know, when the Lord told Abraham, I want you to leave Iraq and go to a new land, did he argue? Did he say, well, let's see, I'll, I'll chart my route, I'll go this way or I'll go that way, or I'll wait till tomorrow or I'll wait and... He just went. He obeyed. Humbly, he did it because he knew that the Lord knew better. He knows better than we do as well. So it's sort of a matter of learning to be able to withstand the details, the satanic details, that have nothing to do with truth, because the Word of God is truth. And the truth, as Christ said, really will make you free. Thank you for joining us for services this week. As always, your being with us makes our joy complete. Until next week when we meet again on this God's holy Sabbath day. May the Lord bless thee and keep thee. May the Lord make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. God bless you all.